Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm happy to see you all here today, and uh, those of you who are streaming and not in the room as well. Um, it's really my delight to um, have a chance to introduce my very long-standing colleague and friend, Dr. Richard Frank. I'm really delighted that he's with us today. Um, he is the Margaret Morris Professor of Health Economics. His research is focused on the economics of mental health and substance abuse care, long-term financing policy, healthcare competition and implementation of health reform and disability policy. He served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services, directing the Office of Disability, Aging, and Long-Term Care Policy. And then he served as a special advisor to the Office of the Secretary at the Department of Health and Human Services um, under the Obama administration as its Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. And I always think about um, Richard as the person who, um, while the ACA was passed, Richard was really integral in the implementation of the ACA and the regulations for the ACA and its implementation for mental health and substance use disorder care across the United States. Um, Dr. Frank serves as an editor of the Journal of Health Economics for nine years. He was awarded the Georgescu Rogan Prize from the Southern Economic Association, the Carl Taub Award from the American Public Health Association, and the Emily Mumford Medal from Columbia University's Department of Psychiatry. He received the Distinguished Service Award from the Mental Health Association of Maryland, the John Eisenberg Mentorship Award, and he's a member of the National Academy of Medicine. He received the Academy Health Distinguished Investigator Award in June 2018 and is co-author with Sherry Gleed of the book Better But Not Well. Um, I would just say that um, I always think about uh, Dr. Frank as really the uh, eminent mental health economist in the United States. He is the person, um, I know I embarrass him when I say this, who is really the, the go-to person for all questions about um, the implementation of economic and social policy to advance the care and the financing of people and persons with um, uh, mental illness and substance use disorders. And so it's really with great delight that I welcome him here for Grand Rounds. And he's going to talk to you about um, mental illness and employment in our evolving economy. So with that, please welcome Dr. Frank. Uh, thanks. It's, uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, what Shelley failed to tell you in that lovely introduction was that the number of uh, economists that focus on mental health could be in that first row there. So being the best is just, you have to modify given the underlying population. Um, anyway, um, I'm here in part to share with you um, uh, some of my growing anxieties. And um, uh, in particular, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, a set of anxieties that have led to a program of research uh, that focuses on how the economy in the United States is changing and the consequences that has for work and particularly employment of people with uh, uh, mental health problems and addiction issues. And um, my concern is that the economy is evolving in a way that will uh, leave a population that has generally been left behind, further behind. And uh, we're at a point in time where we can still start thinking about what to do about that, but there hasn't been a lot of thought being given to that. So uh, if nothing else, hopefully I'll uh, motivate a few of you to join me in worrying about this. Hmm. There we go. Um, so what I'm going to start off with is some good news. I'm going to sort of set some context. Uh, and then I'm going to sort of drill down into um, uh, how uh, mental illness, employment, and social integration fit together, um, how the economy is changing, and why that may be problematic for people with uh, mental disorders and serious mental illnesses in particular. 
And then I want to talk a little bit about some possible lines of remedy. Uh, and you know, it involves clinical work, it involves policy work, it involves program design, et cetera. Okay, so let me start off with the good news, uh, which is over the last uh, 10 years, uh, we've made a tremendous amount of progress in expanding financial access uh, to mental health care in the United States. Uh, if you look at just some of the things that happened, the Mental Health Parity Act in 2008, uh, the Affordable Care Act in 2010, and the 21st Century Cures Act, those three have poured unprecedented amounts of money uh, into mental health and addiction care. Uh, and you know, just a rough back of the envelope estimate is that it's increased the amount of money we're spending on, uh, in those areas by about $10 billion a year. And so it's a big deal. Um, and it turns out the results are starting to show. Um, various measures of access, uh, coverage, et cetera, are starting to sort of move positively. And I'll give you uh, one set of data here that, um, uh, that are worth taking note of. So if you take just the Affordable Care Act uh, and the parity legislation together, and uh, just as a reminder, the Parity Act in uh, uh, 2008 required that all uh, large employment groups um, uh, treat, cover, and manage uh, behavioral health care uh, on the same terms that they manage general medical surgical treatment. And uh, the Affordable Care Act then extended that to touch uh, the individual health insurance marketplace uh, and Medicaid expansion. Uh, and a small group market. So together, uh, that either improved the coverage for people who were already covered or expanded coverage to something good uh, to many people who didn't have co coverage previously. And in total, that added about 174 million, that touched 174 million Americans, okay? Uh, and so, uh, that makes all the work really worthwhile. And um, it has dramatically opened up opportunities for treatment that weren't in place before. And that's not to say that, uh, and it wasn't intended to, uh, fix a variety of other problems associated with uh, uh, treating people with uh, mental illnesses and addictions, but it was at least one big step in removing uh, a set of difficulties that has plagued um, uh, the delivery of those services for the last 60 years or so. Probably before that as well. Okay, so that's the good news. Now, where am I gonna go with you? Um, so, uh, insurance coverage, you know, uh, has expanded and we should kind of celebrate that success but we have, uh, we've failed to integrate people uh, with uh, mental illnesses broadly, but serious mental illnesses in particular, into our communities at large. And if you kind of go back to President Kennedy and you move forward from there, uh, every few years we've recommitted ourselves to expanding access to treatment and integrating people with these illnesses into the mainstream of American life and creating opportunities uh, for them to share uh, in those benefits. And we've come up short in numerous measurable ways. Now, work is a key part of that. Um, uh, work has always been seen as therapeutic, as part of recovery, and as a important mechanism for uh, social and community integration. And uh, we've seen in the last few years key uh, steps forward in uh, our approaches to treatment. If you think about uh, all the work that's being done on first episode psych uh, psychosis, 
And a key element of that is supported employment, is uh, intervening early to keep people engaged in work, in school, so that they do not descend into disability, so that they continue to be part of that sort of American mainstream. And um, <coughs> those, those programs, and I'll talk about them in some detail later, but those programs and our disability policy in this country all are based on the presumption that there are opportunities out there that if we can create the right conditions, people with mental disorders will be able to take advantage of and prosper. And this is the source of my anxiety, uh, that assumption. So the economy is evolving, and it's evolving extraordinarily quickly uh, in some very fundamental ways in terms of what it's demanding of its workers. And those developments, uh, I'm going to argue, may have a profound effect on people with mental illnesses. By the way, while I'm at it, how many of you are afraid of robots? Yeah. Yes, I am too. And we will, we will touch on that in some more detail. OK, uh, this is a recent, can you see that? OK, uh, this is a uh, table that summarizes a recent review uh, uh, that was in Nature Reviews that looked at uh, uh, cog cognitive dysfunctions uh, by the types of uh, uh, mental disorders, and it provides very detailed analyses of the types of impairments that occur. And uh, I'm not going to go through the details of this any, uh, at all, uh, but what I am going to argue is that exactly the kinds of dysfunctions that have been identified repeatedly in the literature are those that the labor market is demanding more and more of. Not more dysfunctions, but more skills uh, against which the dysfunctions are occurring. And that, again, uh, is the source of my anxiety. And so now I'm going to sort of build up from there. So, uh, and you know, some of them, for example, involve executive function. Some of them involve um, um, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of processing speed. Uh, others involve things like the ability to uh, engage interpersonally. And uh, it turns out that major, the most prevalent mental disorders, major depression, bipolar, um, PTSD, general anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, they are all touched by those cognitive dysfunctions, and they all turn out to impact skills. And the skills that are there are concentration, problem solving, communications, memory and organization, adaptability, flexibility. And these are all important for th certain types of jobs. Not all jobs, but certain types of jobs. And in general, what we've seen over the last 20, 30 years is that um, the consequences of mental illnesses uh, in the labor market are reflected in very low attachments to employment, and I'm going to show you some data on that in a second, high rates of participation in disability programs, SSI and Social Security Disability Insurance, um, high rates of poverty, and social isolation. And so those are all reflected. And again, the reason I say social isolation is I'm linking that sort of role of work in terms of our ability to create and maintain relationships. So let me show you some data here. Um, and these are all relative to people with um, no, uh, no diagnosable mental disorders. So you can see that somewhere between uh, there's a uh, the, the, there's a discounting of somewhere between 70, 17 and 38 percent of the rates at which people engage in full-time work 
who have mental disorders compared to people that are like them, only without. And when I say like them, I mean uh, age, gender, race, uh, educational background. And so if anything, that tends to un underestimate the impact of mental disorders because in fact, because of the timing of the onset of these illnesses, uh, people's educational attainments are lower and their training, et cetera. Uh, you'll also notice on this table that part-time work is higher because it's harder to maintain full-time employment and uh, being outside of the labor force occurs uh, at a rate of one and a half to two times as much for people with mental disorders as for um, uh, people without. Uh, now, uh, people with a, a mental illness, if you look again at uh, their background characteristics, age, gender, race, educational attainment, uh, they earn roughly 70% of what somebody just like them without a mental disorder uh, earns. Uh, they're more uh, likely to be in relatively low-skilled occupations. They cluster in low-skilled occupations. Uh, and that somewhere between a quarter and a third of people with a serious mental illness live below the poverty line. Now, um, just to give you a point of comparison, the national average uh, for the United States as a whole is about 12 and a half percent of the population lives under, under the poverty line. So we're talking two to three times the rate. Um, there are two sets of illnesses that uh, generate the most participation in Social Security disability programs. One of them is mental disorders, and I'm leaving out that does not count any intellectual disabilities. That is, mental disorders setting aside intellectual disabilities. And the other one is musculoskeletal issues, and they've been the fastest growing. So if you go back to 2007, before the reset, just before the recession hit, there's been a 26% increase. If you go back to 2010, there's been a 6% increase, and it's ebbed a little bit recently um, uh, as the economy has sort of recovered more strongly. So uh, lessons from the past so far, uh, mental illness gets in the way of work in the old economy. Now I want to turn to the new economy. Okay, so a uh, couple, of, I want to draw your attention to sort of the first two bullets there, which is that occupations um, that involve post-secondary education and training have grown by about five and a half million jobs since 2007, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics. And while at the same time, occupations that require a high school degree lost just under a million and a half jobs during that same period, okay? And 23 per, about 24% of people with a serious mental illness have less than high school educations compared to about 10% um, of the rest of the population. So again, it's over twice uh, the, uh, 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 in a sense, the burden uh, that people with mental illnesses carry. Now, looking forward, um, the, uh, the growth rates in, in employment are going to be quite high um, over the next 10 years uh, for people with a master's degree, 16% or so. Uh, the, uh, the growth rate for people with just a high school level of education is going to be a third of that. So that gives you the, you know, the broad picture, that is, of jobs, counting them um, irrespective of the substance of what's in the job. Let me turn now to a picture of what the demand for specific skills are, okay? So this is a picture of um, 
uh, some work where uh, there, some labor economists have been very carefully looking at what are the skills being demanded by the specific jobs that are growing and shrinking in this economy. And so if you look at the two happy lines, the ones that are going up uh, at the top of the uh, graph, what you'll see is that non-routine interpersonal and non-routine analytic uh, skills are the ones that are growing and have been growing. And if you look at the bottom, you see that uh, routine manual, routine cognitive, and non-routine manual are all sort of shrinking. And so what that tells you is not only are the education, are some of the jobs according to educational status, but actually even within those, there are very specific types of skills that are going to be growing and very specific types of skills where the opportunities are going to be disappearing. And if you go back to that funny picture uh, matrix that I showed you, and you think about the impairments, well, the things that uh, mental illness most often gets in the way of is non-routine interpersonal and non-routine analytic, okay? Again, so evidence for my anxiety. Now, this, uh, I'm not going to trouble many of you who revealed yourselves earlier. This is growth in robots. Uh, and uh, just to give you an idea, just because uh, I know you're all uh, uh, eagerly anticipating the uh, uh, announcement by Amazon about where they're going to locate. And, um, but in 2016, uh, Amazon used 30,000 robots in their facilities to distribute stuff. Um, today, uh, it's 55,000, okay? So it's close to a, du close to a doubling. And uh, there are now plants in China, in parts of the United States, that have you know, dropped their labor forces by 80% because of the use of robots. And uh, so uh, this is something, and this is one of the reasons why that routine manual stuff is going away. And increasingly, because of artificial intelligence, um, the routine cognitive stuff is also, uh, the routine uh, 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 cognitive stuff is also going away. So here is a projection that's being done about uh, what kinds of sort of jobs are the ones that are most likely to disappear. And so we've broken it down into uh, less than $20 an hour, 20 to $40, and over 40. And you can see that there's an 83% probability that a disproportionate share of the jobs that are disappearing are among those uh, that pay people less than $20 an hour. And again, if you start to put all these pieces together, what jobs are those? Low education, low skilled, uh, routine cognitive, routine manual, etc. Now, that does not mean that there are no jobs out there, uh, even, among, uh, even among those that are growing, that can't accommodate some of the impairments that uh, people with a mental disorder carry. Uh, and, oh, actually, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, however, one of the problems is that, um, as we've learned a lot in, from the analysis of the uh, last national election, uh, there are a lot of people out there who don't have a great deal of education and aren't really positioning themselves to get it. And so what's happening is that there's more competition for those jobs that are most suitable for people with the impairments that come with mental illnesses. And so uh, I just, you know, just considering the, the idea of stigma on its own, 
uh, thinking about uh, if there's a competition between somebody who displays some suggestion of a mental illness and somebody who doesn't for the same job, we know who's going to come in second. And so I think that's important to bear in mind. So even though there is job growth in certain areas, there's also more competition for those jobs. And just let me give you a number to put that in perspective. Um, if you think, uh, let's just think about depression. About 7% of people who are currently employed have depression, okay? So we have roughly 155 million people in this country who are working. And so 7% of that is about 11 million people, okay? So just, and we haven't talked about any other disorders, but just on depression where you, you know, you can think about both the interpersonal and their sort of processing speeds and things like that, um, they're at risk. Okay, so um, hopefully you've long forgotten the good news I started with. Um, but I think work is shifting towards non-routine interpersonal skills and non-routine analytic skills. Uh, the impairments that mental, imp that mental disease creates interfere with the development and the application of those particular skills. And um, the employment opportunities where uh, the more routine cognitive and analytic skills and interpersonal skills are present uh, are still there, but they're growing scarcer and they're involving more competition. And so the future outlook uh, and social integration of people, particularly with serious mental illnesses, uh, I think is going to be increasingly challenging. And so therefore, I think action uh, is needed. So let me sort of switch gears here and take a few minutes to talk about the kinds of actions that might be worth looking into, uh, some evidence about uh, some recent progress that we've made on certain fronts, and then also how technology can be our friend, not just our enemy here. Um, so I'm going to talk about three. I'm going to talk about health and mental health interventions, and in particular, I'm going to focus on early intervention programs like first episode psychosis programs, uh, disability policy incentives, particularly incentives for employers, and then looking inside the workplace, how we can use technology and other forms of support to try to keep people engaged in work and to do so early so that, uh, it, it, in a sense, it complements some of the clinical interventions uh, we do, and that at least this is a first, uh, a first round of ideas about where we might put some effort. Um, so the big question is, uh, can, can we alter rates of disability from serious mental illnesses? You know? Uh, in a sense, the promise of the NIMH RAISE pro program, uh, the, um, uh, the investments that many programs, including McLean's, uh, have, made, have been making in first episode psychosis programs are all predicated on the hope that we can change the trajectory of psychosis and serious mental illness to make them less disabling. Now, the evidence to date is, like, pretty mixed on this. Um, the evidence to date suggests that uh, most of these programs use so-called supported employment interventions. Uh, and what we've learned about those uh, is that uh, they tend to result in more work effort uh, and greater social engagement. So that's, that's the good news. Um, there are more relationships formed, people have more activities with other human beings. Um, they've essentially had little or no effect on disability rates, uh, and they've had no meaningful effect on earnings. 
essentially no one gets off of disability because of these programs. And in fact, uh, even those who are, who are sort of on a trajectory to get into disability, there isn't a lot of evidence suggesting uh, that they stay off. Now, what, so, I'm, so that's the depressing spin. I'm going to put a positive spin on it now, which is what Ray's, I think, demonstrated was not what a fully formed early intervention, first episode psychosis program can do. What it did, it demonstrated that once we've engaged somebody in treatment, um, that there is a benefit from putting the package that, is, uh, that, that was crafted together uh, by Ray's to make a positive difference clinically. Uh, and in fact, very few people in the Ray's demonstration were true early episode, early uh, first episode psychosis cases. Okay, let me just give you two numbers. Um, the duration of untreated psychosis in the experimental arm of the Ray's program was 211 weeks. Now, for those of you who don't divide well by 52, that's a little over four years. For the control group, it was 178 weeks or three and a half years, just about under three and a half years. Uh, since a, a few of my psycho, uh, psychiatrist friends are here, I would, I would claim that none of them would say that those are likely to be first episode psychoses. And so, in fact, uh, um, we haven't really tested the full, the full model. Uh, but there were some clues that should leave us a, li a little bit optimistic. Yes. So what they did is they divided the samples into people who were initiated into the experimental arm uh, before 74 weeks and after 74 weeks. And it turns out the positive results all came from the people who were engaged early. And so just for cost effectiveness reasons, if you were a high duration of untreated psychosis, it was a very, this is not all that cost effective. It's unbelievably cost effective for people who, engage, who you engage in the low, at, with low duration of untreated psychosis. And so I think that creates uh, uh, some evidence to suggest that uh, if we couple the raise package with the right kind of outreach and engagement strategies, we have the opportunity to actually make a difference. In addition, there's been some research showing that cognitive remediation interventions layered on top of all this actually helps with the types of skills that the labor market is asking for. And in fact, there was a demonstration done uh, uh, in HHS uh, where what uh, the strategy was was to do something that was a little bit like RAISE, not exactly what RAISE is, but instead of um, being clinically, clinical center or clinic based, the intervention was in the workplace. People were identified in the workplace who had early signs of psychosis. And there, by intervening early while in the workplace, they were able to keep people at work and they actually significantly lowered the transition of people into disability, both private short-term disability and long-term disability. So again, that is that those couple bits of evidence together suggest that there may be reason for optimism but it means kind of doing our work really differently in terms of how we outreach, how we engage people, where we touch them. And uh, while that should leave us optimistic sort of programmatically, it also creates lots of other challenges around ethics, privacy, et cetera. But, but you know, those are workable problems, presumably. Um, 
so uh, I guess the, the basic lesson is we, you know, the more we target duration of un, short durations of untreated uh, psychosis, the more we develop uh, ways of paying for services and structures that will allow us to engage people uh, early in their courses of illness, I think the more likely we are to be successful and the more likely we can be to uh, either maintain the skills that people have before they lose them uh, or to create interventions that will help restore. Okay. okay. Um, let me turn to uh, policy now. Uh, now, we've learned a few things about um, employers. Uh, we, find, we find that employers that carry disability insurance tend to make more investments in, in keeping people at work and making them return to work. Very strong evidence on this. Uh, Employers currently have an incentive to cost shift onto Social Security. If somebody's been working for a while and they can go to Social Security disability insurance, the employer does not necessarily feel bound uh, to invest in the kinds of things that uh, Social Security might do for them. Um, and so the evidence suggests that targeted return to work policies and disability management programs can be effective in retaining workers with mental disorders. It's not just uh, that demonstration program that I'm, that I'm talking about, is that this is experience from actually in vivo uh, disability management programs that, that some large employers have. So two proposals have been floated uh, related to that. The first is to uh, mandate private uh, uh, disability insurance for larger employers to actually sort of force them to not cost shift, force them to internalize the benefits of doing good things to keep people at work and return to work when they've been out. Um, the second is to experience rate uh, SSDI. And by that, I mean that if you put in the right programs and you show results, your disability tax premium would be lowered. Okay. Now, the good news is that uh, those things encourage support and accommodation and, and engagement of people with mental illnesses. The bad news is it also creates incentives to make sure you don't hire those people in the first place. And, uh, you know, in their sort of simple forms, that would be, making them work would require a tremendous amount of effort uh, enforcing the provisions of the Americans with Disability Act, which we're not very good at. But we could be good at. We could be a lot better at. Speaking of the Americans with Disability Act, um, it turns out quite a, that, that complaints about non-accommodation of mental disorders are an extraordinarily frequent complaint to the Department of Labor in, in terms of complaints about violation of the Americans with Disability Act. And so uh, there is a lot of room right now for enforcement, for uh, um, uh, creating a standard uh, for accommodation that is parallel to that for physical disabilities. Right now, there's a lot of ambiguity in terms of what the standard is. And so we could make a lot of progress on that. Uh, there's evidence suggesting that evidence-based depression treatment uh, connected to the workplace is effective in keeping people at work and raising and keeping them from uh, losing income and employment, uh, and employers should have an interest in doing this if, in fact, they face the benefits of, um, through insurance premiums and otherwise, from um, doing the right thing. Okay, uh, the third and final area that I want to touch on is assistive technology. Now, 
there is a lot out there on assistive technology, but almost all of it has focused on dementia or Alzheimer's and dementia. And very little of it has focused on the types of supports that you need uh, uh, for many mental illnesses. Uh, now, in general, the work that has been done in the mental health area suggests that uh, these uh, technology interventions are most effective once patients have been stabilized. And so uh, uh, the question is, uh, uh, are there some platforms that we can use to start to sort of uh, engage in that, in, in that way? And it turns out the data suggests that there are, that 90% uh, uh, of people with a mental disorder uh, have at least one digital device. Um, people with uh, mood disorders tend to have them more than people with schizophrenia. Um, and about half had um, access to a smartphone. Uh, that's a little lower than the general population, but that's still quite a bit. And so uh, the second question is, uh, is there a perception that these types of technologies could be helpful in managing illness and creating supports? And the answer to that is, yeah, sort of. Uh, in a recent survey done by National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, uh, just under half uh, use smartphones and apps to manage their symptoms. Uh, for example, audio hallucinations through the use of certain types of music and, uh, and, and, and sort of uh, sounds. Uh, a bunch use it for, uh, to deal with um, executive function things like calendar reminders, uh, uh, medication reminders, and the like. Uh, about a quarter use uh, these technologies to uh, contact peers and, and, and monitor their symptoms. So there is a, a, a substantial um, coterie of people out there uh, who you can start to engage, who suffer from these illnesses, who engage uh, with the technology, and that's true of even people with some of the most serious mental disorders. So how would you do that? Well, uh, the evidence to date suggests you need a lot of training, and you need ongoing training. You need to continuously touch base and make sure people are appropriately using it. Um, they're particularly effective around uh, cognitive skills uh, that are linked to executive function, some on coping and concentration, and then others uh, on self-management. So those seem to be the most promising avenues for apps and, 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 and related things. Now, most recently, um, there's been some studies of using robots to be coaches. And if you sort of go back to sort of the, um, uh, the positive results around intervening in the workplace, you can imagine having robots in the workplace that are actually helping in a variety of ways to coach. Now, we don't really know what the long-term results are, uh, there seems to be, at least in the short term, enthusiasm about this, but we don't know. But these are avenues where technology could actually potentially uh, be helpful. So let me sum up. Um, I think the point that I've hopefully hammered home uh, is that the labor market is changing and is changing in exactly ways that you might hope wouldn't happen because they're so disadvantageous to people with the impairments uh, associated with mental illness. Um, that early intervention programs aren't there yet in terms of what we've learned about them, but there is enough um, empirical clues that they could be so that it's worth pursuing, but I think it's uh, the outreach, the engagement, and the uh, focus on skill building and where you do it, particularly in the workplace, seems very important. And I think that requires another round of clinical development. And then I think there are
technologies out there that we should be working on to figure out ways to support people uh, in the workplaces. And, and there are platforms out there that people have in their daily lives that would enable us to leverage those types of engagements that are present uh, uh, to do better than we have. And then finally, there's a whole lot of policy stuff that we could do to make things better. So I'll stop there. Any questions? Sure. Could you wait for the microphone? I apologize. Sorry. Hi. My, um, I have a son who was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder um, 10 years ago. At the time, he was a senior in a very elite private college in New England. And what we experienced was a complete lack of support around his illness. And I'm wondering with some of the um, techniques or uh, uh, things you were mentioning with respect to the, to the workplace, oftentimes these illnesses occur when young people are in college or perhaps even high school, and how we can try and um, educate and en enable um, the, the educators of the world to recognize um, and support because there's such a debilitating um, outcome when you can't finish um, the education you've put time into. My son end ended up graduating actually from BC. They were incredibly supportive. Um, around his illness, um, but what I found with this other institution was they were afraid of liability, we need him to leave, um, and so it created more time for him to complete his degree because, of course, three years in, you need, you know, so, and I know it's much harder because it's a for disparate community, but I do think that's a really critical component of, especially young people, a lot of times with schizophrenia, they tend to be highly intelligent, yep. so uh, just any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, yeah, I think, in a sense, all my comments about intervening early, intervening in the workplace, and things like that carry over into what you want to do in college. You know, so uh, less well-developed in the su supported employment model is a su supported education model, which sort of uh, borrows many of the insights from that work. And now there's, there's a variety of... of um, uh, sort of tests of those principles uh, going on out there clinically right now. And uh, my impression is that you do get the same kinds of positive results, but sort of, in a sense, incomplete positive results. And partly because, in fact, again, I think we wait too long. And we, we, we wait too long for just some of the reasons you pointed out, because when you know that those consequences are awaiting you, once you raise your hand saying, I have this problem, then you're going to wait longer to raise your hand. So I think there's, uh, you know, th that's a, s a different set of incentives, but I think those uh, have to be addressed, because um, unless we figure out uh, how to do that early outreach, I think that it's going to be really, really difficult to use at least the promising clinical interventions we have to make the difference that we could make. So I'm one of the people who's probably less scared of the robots, but um, in terms of just uh, forthcoming ethical issues, uh, I wonder if um, as the technology allows us to reach more people and has all the facilitative impacts that you described and is cost effective, uh, would you see potentially down the line an unintended consequence of a kind of multi-tier system where some people get the robot coaching and then others may get the relational human being engagement? And I, I, we may be too early in the process to raise those kinds of issues, but I wonder if there's huh. anything that's come up in your thinking so far about this. I thought you were going someplace else, and I formulated an answer to a different question. So I'm going to give you that answer. <laughs> but uh, uh, just, and I'm, not, I'm giving you that answer not because uh, I didn't hear your question, but rather that um, I think if, if that, the disparity that you outlined was the one uh, that was worrying us, we would have come way down the road in a good way than, than what I'm worrying about first. So the, the, 
the ethical challenges that uh, that I'm concerned about are that if you start taking that kind of outreach seriously, you start approaching people in the workplace, in the school, uh, in the college dorms and things like that, you start mucking with people's lives in a way that typical clinical programs don't. And I think that opens up a whole set of issues. And some of them we've already seen with some of the people who are kind of doing prodromal studies where they've sort of, um, you know, given fairly substantial doses of antipsychotics to kids they really weren't sure about, and that creates a whole bunch of consequences. So I, I think there is a, a set of issues about getting involved in people's lives, you know, labeling that goes on, um, um, sort of uh, what kinds of interventions you give them, uh, and the sort of negative consequences of kind of not getting it right. Uh, that, uh, that I worry about first. And then if, we're, if we solve those problems, then we can go on to your problem. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, two questions. One is, uh, I'm terrified of robots. Okay, me and, too. <laughs> um, not just because of self-driving fatalities and things like that, but I think the dehumanization piece is very huge. Um, and I think about Benny's, my beloved mom and pop shop of New England that closed this year, I think that's a big part of it. But I mention them because when I was in community psychiatry, they had one of the best supported employment programs that I've ever known about. And part of that is because it was a mom and pop outfit and the management philosophy was very, very compassionate. And so I see automata automation as, you know, it's easier to be distant, it's easier to just be corporate looking at the bottom line and in that construct how do we hope to have supported employment so that's the first question the other is just that oftentimes I think that those with serious mental illnesses um, they, they have a superior talent most of them do you can identify some area where they're very very talented way above average but it's so narrow and it doesn't fit, it's too niche to fit into usual work opportunities, and is there a way to do something around helping that? Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, you're, you're raising sort of just issues. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a little less worried about the uh, sort of bureaucratization of supported employment programs. I, I, but I do think that your point about them being high touch has to be maintained. I think that that's important. But you know, we still haven't quite cracked the code. You know, we've cracked the code in the fact that it's better than anything else we do. But it hasn't cracked the code in terms of uh, can we really uh, hold people in substantial numbers in mainstream employment? And that's, that's in, you know, in a sense, uh, I've been running around the country a little bit starting to look at these cognitive remediation programs and things. And, you know, I keep saying to my, you know, the, uh, being an economist are very cynical people. And so, so uh, I, I, I sort of keep telling myself I can't lapse into therapeutic optimism like all my psychiatrist friends do. And, uh, and so I, I, I go to these uh, programs. But you know, I think you're right that we have to get beyond the niche or we're not going to solve this problem. And so I think identifying those talents and building on them is good for a variety of reasons. But actually making sure that there are places for them, that they don't get left behind in the workplace means trying to uh, build the skills, uh, develop the policies, uh, maybe even developing targeted employment programs uh, uh, that can help uh, build up that, that, that skill base uh, for those folks so that they can be in the main street. 
I'm Jesse. I'm an occupational therapist at Appleton, which is a residential for um, people with living psychotic disorders. And I think this is great that you brought this to McLean because I think it's something that's lacking at McLean. I think that there's two vocational counselors and myself as the only OT. And I'm just curious as um, your thoughts as somebody that guides people in the workforce as well as finding meaningful life occupations of any advice that you would give us as clinicians to kind of help guiding people in this realm see, using your, all your experience? Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're now really drifting away from, you know, already I've said lots of things that I really don't know what I'm talking about on. <laughs> so you're, you're, re you're really uh, 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 pushing me here. But um, I mean, I, I do think that actually, uh, uh, again, in the spirit of sort of uh, early development, engaging directly with the workplaces and, uh, and employers and trying to figure out how to sort of both, you know, one of the nice things about the technology change is people are re redesigning jobs in kinds of new kinds of ways and figuring out how to do that, uh, you know, because now there's more um, telecommuting and there's more uh, things where you don't have to go out as much, things where, you know, things that might throw you if you, you know, have to get on a bus every day and, and do stuff, uh, that's not going to happen quite as much. It also doesn't engage you socially as much. But there are ways, I think, where you can sort of work in, with the job redesign in ways that could benefit your patients.